one of the things that was not included in my bio uh, was that I did my undergraduate degree in this department. Um, the design media arts department uh, many years ago. And I have to just start this conversation by saying I am so moved that this conversation is even happening in this space, in this department. It was not at all happening when I was a student here. And I'm really just so thrilled, like really emotional about it, that we, you know, are having political uh, conversations around our work as graphic designers, media artists, artists, cultural producers in the 21st century in a digital world. Um, so, so one of the things that just immediately struck me about the th all three presentations is the role of design and just visual semiotics of these things. I mean, for example, Sophia talking about these websites that Dylan Roof would go to and they looked like, you know, they spoke the language, the visual language of a neutral news site or a reputable journalism site, something like this. Um, that's a graphic design issue, right? Media design. And, and the same, you know, I think like the visuality thread is seen in all of these is how representation just in a very basic, like, kind of formal level um, is working here. So one of the things that it makes me think about was, um, in my experience as an undergraduate here, my mentor was Willem Henry Lucas, who is a very political designer. And we would often talk about what the politics were that were embedded in certain choices we were making as designers. For example, a uh, typography choice is a political one. Um, who made it? Did you have to pay for it? Is it a corporate font? Is it used by corporations so that it looks corporate? You know, are there fonts that you use in journalism sites that bring you a sense of legitimacy as a news site? I mean, and I think that our generation is, is so well we're well equipped to be able to make media and make our own images on the web. And I think that, you know, we can be very savvy about how those get deployed. And in the case of maybe the Council for Conservative Citizens, is that what it was called? You know, they probably had a good sense of what kind of graphic design decisions they needed to make in order to seem neutral. So I was wondering if maybe, um, we could start by talking about how I think, you know, this question of structures of oppression and domination that are in place in the real world getting replicated online often happens visually and through uh, just very basic kind of visual uh, cues. Font, uh, like if it's in bold, you know, that signals something different than if it's blinking yellow, you know? So maybe we could talk just sort of about the visual literacy, media literacy that's inherent in digital practices, um, especially in the 21st century, especially for millennials, the generation, you know, that grew up being very comfortable making media online. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Are we in the dark? Right. <laughs> Thank you, Maroon. This is a. I'm happy to jump sure in on that. I think it's a great. I think it's a great prompt. So one of the things that I um, like to talk about as well in this kind of issue, uh, but particularly with the example of Google, is that um, what we have is kind of an aesthetic of a white page, a blank white slate, with a box, an empty box, that communicates um, simplicity. It's, sim it's simple to put in a query, and it's simple to get back an answer. And yet, the kinds of questions that often get put into a search engine are highly complicated, nuanced, um, contested kinds of ideas 
or concepts that a simple a simplicity is actually not the, the right approach. And so we have a socialization, and I certainly see this uh, myself with kind of now in this role um, teaching is the kind of an expectation of a simple and immediate answer, an instantaneous uh, put in, get out kind of aesthetic, and that that translates to how knowledge is produced. And of course, we know that is not how knowledge is produced. Um, people go to war over knowledge, right? So I think there's, um, there's something that we have to be incredibly careful about. What I talk um, uh, in my work um, about what would, it what would it mean, for example, to make knowledge transparent and to see all of the complexities of it and then have to make choices within that complexity rather than an aesthetic of white space and nothingness that communicates something, right? And it's a falsehood. So Dana Boyd, for example, talks about, um, she did studies on teenagers who moved from MySpace to Facebook. And um, what she found in her study is that students who, um, high school students who were still on MySpace were typically marginalized students. They weren't um, jocks, they weren't cheerleaders, they were kind of like alternative, whatever that means, and also people of color, I guess we're alternative, are we? And um, <laughs> And, uh, and part of the kinds of things that students reported out, especially in an era like a 21st century era of colorblind ideology, where students didn't want to name in an explicit way how they felt about their peers, they would say things like, um, well, Facebook is cleaner. It has cleaner design. It's, it's, um, it's not so messy. Right? And these were code words that she found that reflected that the incredible, the incredible hyper individuality that you can express on MySpace, right? Like you got the, you know, the marching ants or whatever you code in there, um, were, uh, those were signifiers of difference that in a space like Facebook that was made as like an Ivy League social networking platform where you have a high degree of homogeneity in that kind of university environment that the, the aesthetic of clean lines of not pointing to, to, to difference in individualism um, was actually valued, right? But it also was loaded with these kind of class and racial markers. So I think these are the things that, um, you know, you go read her work because it's really powerful. And what happened as students left MySpace and went to Facebook, you had a, we lost a whole generation of especially girls who were learning how to code. They could do basic HTML kind of work by um, personalizing their MySpace pages. You guys probably weren't even born when everybody was on MySpace. It's fine. Um, but this is so, so what, it, what, 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 what did we lose also? in these kinds of design choices and moves and the discourse and rhetorics that we used around them. And so I think, it, I think these are absolutely design questions and issues and they're explicitly political and loaded with these kind of racial, class, gendered dynamics. Yeah, like I just wanna uh, offer a rejoinder before uh, y'all jump in, but I think always about um, you know, in arts, which is the world that I ended up moving in more than the design world, there's this word that gets tossed around a lot, which is very funny to me, which is uh, site-specific. Like, as though there is a thing that's not that, right? Like, like this idea of space, and artists talk a lot about space, as though it's this neutral, empty, ahistoric location. Like, what about place? Like, place in, implies, you know, there's a cost of rent, there were neighbors, there's rules, there's cracks in the walls, there's street noise, there's all of these things that are part of that location. And I think in digital space, which we often talk about, that is, you know, those assumptions are carried over again. Like, this idea that the cleanest uh, digital design solution is the best is, impl is an implicit value. You know, there are always um, these redesigns of social media platforms that are, are done, you know, according to the company to make things cleaner, mm -hmm. which I just think is so funny. Like, that that's the implicit value that we all now in this world like want. Like, oh, I need to clean up my Facebook feed, I need to clean up my Twitter feed, like this kind of cleanliness. Very strange to me. 
Well, and before, before MySpace came to the world, everybody was, or peop, not everybody at all, the few people who had a presence online were doing everything entirely from scratch, learning from other people by looking at what they had done. But everybody was able to have an entirely unique, like the, the system allowed for an entirely unique presence. MySpace sort of was somewhere in between there and what Facebook is now. Um, Twitter is largely proliferated because it's so easy to do, but we're all within the straight jacket of that character count. And it seems like we're increasingly putting ourselves into these narrow containers through which we can express ourselves. I mean, Facebook is changing a little bit now, but the, the ability to, the only affect you can apply to something is you like it, you have no other option. Um, I find that just to be very interesting. I don't want to dominate. I'm going to just say really quickly that I think you're right. I mean, what has happened for those of us who remember a pre-digital, uh, pre-internet and kind of came of age, which would be my generation, um, on the web, you know, there was a, a certainly, um, you know, the, the commercial web environment was kind of late to the game. I mean, it took a while. I remember when like everybody was like, you know, some teenager owned AT&T.com, you know, and like then they're like, oh my God, we got to get that domain. Um, you know, so like that was happening all over corporate America. Everybody owned something and like was subverting it. Um, and, and so you're right. I mean, what's now totally normalized is that we function within these corporate containers. And um, with very little recognition of, for example, our digital labor, that just our, 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 ourselves as an audience is the commodity, right? So Dallas Smythe and the audience commodity. You know, we have to understand that we're, um, we, these containers in, in many ways um, shape our behavior and socialize a particular kind of normalcy. And um, it's incredibly diff difficult to intervene upon it. Though there's no interesting um, activism that comes specifically kind of from those constraints. Um, you know, for example, getting, uh, there's an example of an activist getting kind of Nike to customize his sneakers with the word sweatshop on it, which they, you know, didn't want to do. So kind of using the kind of constraints mm -hmm. as a way to kind of speak back to that corporate yeah. system in interesting ways. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I think what's, what's interesting also is how these spaces have, and within these constraints, people are finding ways to critique other forms of media. Um, and uh, it seems like, um, and, and some two specific examples that I can, that I can really think of re uh, recently is the, that hashtag, um, um, if they gunned me down, um, where uh, young men of color, um, especially black men, were showing, um, you know, side by side using Instagram or, um, or, um, or other forms of like social media to show side by side um, how um, they, they choose to depict themselves versus how media might, um, you know, mainstream media might depict them if they, um, if they were gunned down. And I thought that was very powerful and provocative because it was a critique of, um, of, um, of, of broadcast media. Um, and then you see this in, um, in a place like China where um, you'll see um, you know, uh, propaganda memes. Um, people will, will take um, classical Chinese propaganda and then remix that um, and, and challenge the, you know, kind of this traditional, um, again, broadcast media that, um, that uh, you know, uh, previously most people had to just inherit and uh, could remix in and maybe on a small scale um, you know, locally with, a, you know, uh, with posters. Um, but the ability to distribute that through these networks um, becomes very powerful. Um, and it seems, it seems like there's um, you know, this, this, this you know, there is this opportunity to make um, more public this critical discourse in media, and that critical discourse needs to go back onto the media itself that people are using, um, that, uh, that in using and in, in finding so much power through Instagram and Twitter to critique broadcast media, we're, we're forgetting that those platforms themselves, they're themselves media, they are, they are themselves a form of mediation, and that they, they themselves have their own um, biases that, um, that need to be critically examined, and it would be um, interesting. I'm kind of thinking of this kind of snake eating its tail with what that kind of critical cr critique of the of the very platform in which you're doing your critique, what that might look like, and what that um, how we could shape a public discourse around that. On um, one of the things I was thinking when you were talking was um, about the sort of how imperialism has has now begun to function within languages on the internet, and how we can see you know that first uh, that map where you know the language is just re redraw um, you know geopolitical lines um, I'm wondering I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about you know there's a lot of discourse in in uh, post-colonial decolonial thought around how the colonizers uh, you know 
theft of the language, the indigenous language, is a function of imperialism. And I'm wondering if, you know, like, you know, all of this you know, literature that I've read about it is, is pre-internet so far. And I feel like this is the first time I've started to think about how languages are, are um, still in that process, but now in a digital way. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about it, the relationship maybe between imperial colonial um, histories and, and methods yeah, um, with language. Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, there. Um, I think you know, uh, you know, the history of, of, of like erasing languages um, is, is very much um, a, a colonial um, you know um, artifact, and um, um, and it's, it's often invisible that the um, it, um, invisible to um, to the next generation. I think, especially um, United States. I um, um, you know, I, I grew up. Uh, my family is Filipino Chinese. I grew up speaking only English. Um, it it, ju it just takes one generation for access uh, to you know, to one's native tongue to to just vanish. And, and disappear, and certainly um, uh, this is this has a, a very long history, and um, and it's it's interesting because um, the very platforms that um, are disseminating across the world are um, are are largely being designed and developed in in one one part of the world, uh, which happens to be um, where I live, um, and. Uh, um, and that that um, that that inherent bias um, that um, that one region of the world, which um, you know um, um, you know is is just one small perspective, um, then um, places pressures on other people to uh, to have to learn that language. Um, and and this um, and I I think about um, kind of these these language biases as being a, a full stack problem in, in technology design. We talk about the full stack um, about. Um, you know, all, all the way down from the very code in which um, in which people have, um, you know, we, we, there's so much talk about the open source uh, software movement and the ability to create and shape your software and your me your media environment. Um, that code is, um, you know, the human facing part of that is in English, um, and it's, um, you know, it's uh, simple phrases. Um, you know, yes, you can learn those those phrases, but um, can you imagine trying to relearn code in, in a language that you don't speak. Um, and you're, suddenly you're having to learn two languages, the programming language and then um, the language in which the programming language is expressed. Um, and then it moves up to, um, to the typography pressures. Um, uh, uh, and so um, you know, uh, the ability to input um, Arabic um, on a mobile phone um, up until recently was uh, severely limited. And people, um, uh, Arabic speakers literally had to use Roman numerics to express their language online, which was incredibly creative. There's these uh, creative workarounds for, um, for the language. But um, as a result, had to use a, you know, a Latin script um, and basically erase their script from the internet until input systems improved. Um, and then it, it goes up from there into content um, and how um, you know um, if you want to know what's going on in the world, if you want to have access to um, 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 here I used the Wikipedia example, but another example would be Stack Overflow. Um, again, um, of such an important um, place for people to learn how to build the software around them. Um, if that's only that language, that knowledge is only available in English and Portuguese right now. Um, you're, you're the pressure to have to learn those languages um, in, so, um, increases substantially, um, and. Uh, um, and then, um, and then all the way to the typography, and we we're talking about the political decisions around typography. Um, you know, in English, we have um, in Latin. Uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, Latin speaking uh, languages that use Latin letters. You have a you have a great wide variety of, of typography and fonts so that you can use. And if you have that kind of um, you know that kind of uh, critical knowledge about how these the, the kind of imp um, implications of all these fonts, you can really make important design decisions. But if you have access to only one or two fonts, um, suddenly the ability for you to create um, a space um, around uh, the, the very content that you're and the sites that you're trying to create um, be again becomes limited, and you're um, inheriting um, you know some, uh, someone else's designs around um, uh, around uh, your typography. So these biases and these pressures um, exist, um, you know, up across the board, and um, and the, you know the, the very pressure to to join a major network like Facebook or Twitter um, then um, then pressures you to have to learn um, you know the, the languages in which they operate. So it's it's very much these uh, this kind of colonial um, you know uh, pressures on language are very much reproduced. Um, yeah, it's like code switching, but yeah. for you know cultural things like you have to. I was just having a conversation with my friend who's Polish the other day, and he was saying, you know because of globalization and imperialism, he can talk to me about The Simpsons or something, but I won't have any idea about the Polish TV shows that he grew up watching. Um, and I think that this kind of you know, way of cultural pernicious pervasiveness from English considered to be the universal language now, I mean, this is really getting replicated exponentially in the digital space. 
absolutely. Uh, and, um, and, and, and even within English-speaking cultures, um, there's also just the, the general valuation of who's, whose English is more important. Um, and uh, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, um, there, um, when, we, when we're talking about English-speaking internet, um, most people are thinking you know, United States, Canada, United Kingdom, and, um, um, and uh, maybe Australia. But, um, but many other countries, are, um, uh, do, um, people do speak English. Um, and even then, their, their, um, their voices and their, their perspectives are often devalued. And, Underserved. So, in addition to building voice, I think you know we need a culture of, of also building uh, better tools for listening and of uh, this kind of pipelines for um, for uh, for evaluation of of the, um, you know these, these uh, new voices online because uh, you can shout all you want and have new voice, but if if, if there's not enough listening, it's uh, um, the, the, those connections aren't made. Yeah, I want to add to. I think there's this economic dimension um, around, especially at, you know in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, where. Um, truly, I mean, it's a closed community of, of mostly men um, and uh, well-documented kind of racism and sexism and exclusion that happens, um, particularly in venture capital funding. So that the paradigm, again, around design happens, to, uh, happens in the context of um, commodity, right? So what can be commodified and sold, packaged, make profit, that's a driving paradigm, um, design paradigm, I would argue, in Silicon Valley that really affects everyone else. If you don't have millions of dollars, you actually can't implement a lot of these kinds of projects that we would, might offer up would be critiques um, or, or subversions or, or some other kind of alternative. Um, so the opting out and going to other things, like what other things, how can those things be created when, there's, uh, when they're happening, happening in the context of really hyper-capitalism in Silicon Valley. Um, and of course, the, the biases, again, that we don't see is that um, the, the incredible profit you know, margins that happen around um, platforms and technology designs coming out of the valley um, are in direct relationship to kind of our economic policies of globalization so that the, the, the manufacturing jobs are offshored to the places where children can make those technologies or people can live in dorms. And we've you know, read the kind of Foxconn stories um, where, where, for example, in the Congo, um, people who are doing the mining for Colton are living in the most extreme sexual violence, um, rape, um, kind of assault conditions in the world, according to the United Nations. And so those things get outsourced. So what gets outsourced um, in the design of our um, projects is really important as a kind of humanitarian issue. Um, one thing that we don't talk about, it, I'm start starting to take up in my own work, is um, the sustainability of these, these technologies as well. We have a serious design crisis around information communication technologies and their contribution to global warming. We just saw the latest reports coming out now, um, post kind of the Paris bombing and just prior to that, that that global that climate change issues are directly implicated in the destabilization of many nations, where we are starting to see tremendous. Um, consequence as a result of that destabilization. And we're implicated again in these while we're like fetishizing Google and Facebook. And so I think that it's like we have, we need a radical design change. And I might ask, you know, if I were teaching like an HCI class or a design class with you, I would say, you know, how, how are you gonna design this so that not one life is lost? What if that were the design imperative rather than what's your IPO gonna be? So the, it's the paradigms within which we're designing that are really important too. Sophia, I have uh, two follow-ups with that. One is the statement that you made that people seem to trust search engines. And so like, my question is, why do you think people trust search engines? But that leads to the next question, which is um, this idea of proprietary and corporate data um, versus open systems, public systems. And why do you think that all of our data is within these proprietary um, algorithms and ways of storing rather than in things that are more open and more public? So these are great questions. I mean, part of the reason we trust search engines is because if we need to find out uh, like what time Starbucks close, it gives us the answer, right? And so that's crucial information that some people need. Do you know, I mean, if you need to know what time does what, I, you know, my class start, and I, you know, I got to go online and get the schedule. 
because it's the first week of class, you can, in the room, okay, in the, or the map, it, there are kinds of banal types of information that search engines are excellent at um, indexing and then providing for us. And that reinforces our trust in them. Now, when we start to put complex ideas into these environments, other things happen. And that's where um, we, we, we lose our, our sense of um, making sense of what's appropriate to put in and what's not. And of course, it, any of us up here who, who teach, you know, you see, um, uh, you know, oftentimes like under, uh, this is a tip for anybody here who's an undergrad, you know, you see your professors see it when your papers come in and you're citing things that make no sense to a faculty member as like a legitimate cite, citation, right? Like there are certain things that you must have Googled that because there's nothing scholarly about that <laughs> and that's a no. You can't go on that, but you don't know, right? Because you can trust it for all these other types of information searches. So that's part of the challenge. I think in our field, you know, we might say that, um, you know, librarians and information professionals, we've really been focused on scholarly information and scholarly knowledge, kind of a different type of curated and vetted information. Um, and we have not put a lot of our attention as a field, as a practice on the kind of broader indexing of the web and curating the web. Um, I'm certainly trying to implore people who do that type of work to, to consider that that might be an alternative way for us to think about. I mean, what if we had a, a search engine, I often say, that was curated by um, all of the research universities in the, in the, in the world? right, not just in the United States, but, if, but in the world. There are so many forms of knowledge, for example, that we don't even have access to, again, because of the language, right, brilliant thinking that's happening from other parts of the world that's really highly inaccessible. And these are the kinds of challenges that I think we're facing in the kind of library and information science, information studies fields, is this access to knowledge has always been a key driver for, you know, millennia, um, for people who keep the record um, and knowledge. Um, but in the commercial spaces, which is where the majority of people live on the web, um, that has not been in the, in the bullseye. And I think that's part of the barrier that we have to work through. Maybe some of you will come do graduate work in information studies and can help us think through these, because they are design issues, too. Marika, do you want to jump in? I think that it's also the, that they seem on their, they're not a thing we're taught to read critically. Um, they seem very neutral and objective and even the way in which the language there is used right it's the things that pop up with the highest relevancy right to the top of your google search for example and we pick on google a lot but that's you. because google is seven, more than 70 percent of the market share for searches in the united states so it matters and yeah. it's, it is a target for a particular reason um but it the, it, the design itself is intended of course yes. when we come back to that to look neutral and unless people are taught to read that critically the way in which you're taught to read other information critically, why would yeah. you? Also, they happen, in, you know, Google or search engines, um, they're a ranking format. So the already always um, way of thinking about ranking, especially in the context of the West or the United States, is what? We're number one, right? If it's first, it's the best. If it's on page 10,000 whatever, we don't even care because the paradigm of ranking is actually the, the design driver, right? And so that has an incredible impact on why we believe, right? Because it must be right. But why, why porn, up until I wrote that bitch magazine article, about six months after I wrote, wrote that article, they changed the algorithm and black girls don't get pornified as badly anymore. Um, I can't say it's the article, but I can't say it's not. So <laughs> all I'm saying is that the, the you know, uh, who has the most kind of political um, uh, capital um, and economic capital is the porn industry on the web. Are you kidding? I mean, it's like we wouldn't have credit card processing and um, video and audio if the porn industry hadn't put a ton of money behind that so that they could sell their products. So again, we don't really think about um, these other economic and kind of design drivers that are the, providing the context for, for how we receive. Um, uh, yes, um, it, it, it's got me thinking in terms of like, um, you know, design and design like provocations is, 
you know, there's this fetishization around um, you know, intuitive design and simple design and how those can be um, extremely dangerous. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that intuitions are founded on assumptions and, um, and if you are designing to make things as simple and as clickable as possible without have, forcing people to have to think through what clicking means, what searching means, um, and that this whole ethos of, of not, um, not making the user think um, is, a, is, a, is a, a great way to hide um, you know, the, the, uh, the implicit biases and explicit biases that these systems contain. Um, so it, it would be interesting, I think, um, to think about, rethink a, you know, a kind of um, design, a, a friction of design that, um, that would, would show like, what, what, is, what is happening beyond, beyond, behind this, this simple little box. What, what is this algorithm doing? What is it, how, is it, how is it floating up things that are relevant? And how, how, are, how is your search history um, and your, your location um, impacting these results? And um, uh, you can imagine a, a Google that makes it difficult for you. Instead of, I'm feeling lucky, it's a, you know, I have to work for it or something. And, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, what, what could that look like? I, I don't know, but it's, um, um, it's, it's interesting to think about a kind of contra-intuitive design that, um, uh, that can raise these questions in interesting ways. Um. I'll ask Anna a quick question um, related to what you were discussing. Um, what if we assume that text is no longer the standard? I mean, text was necessary at one time because of how slow bits would travel, but now we can work with different kinds of media. So le we, yesterday we were talking a little bit about languages that aren't character-based or don't really have a written form, um, and how working with audio directly can enable different kinds of conversations. So I was wondering, like, what is the state of the art of that, or where do you imagine that going to allow other voices to come into play? Yeah, I think um, you know, the most interesting to me is the WeChat example, which I showed, and you saw on that picture of Leo Messi. I didn't get to talk about it until I was rushing through it, but that, that interaction um, of him holding this phone um, like this um, is him pressing a button and kind of speaking into we WeChat, which is a, uh, a Chinese social network that started out a little like WhatsApp, um, but is, is a lot more robust now. Um, and, and he's speaking into, into the mic um, and then releases the button and that sends an audio message um, to the recipient. And it's not a transcribed audio message, it is just the audio message. Um, and um, uh, WeChat was sort of a pioneer in that interaction. We now have that with um, iMessage and WhatsApp. Um, and, um, um, and part of the reason that, that this would became very popular is that, again, the difficulty of inputting, um, inputting Chinese into, um, into um, a mobile phone. Um, and uh, you know, Chinese being a non-alphabetic language, um, the, um, you know, there, there are many forms of input. And, um, and it's interesting that um, the keyboard kind of stepped away. The, this idea of even, a simple idea of even using a keyboard to, to input your language um, you know, moved into um, just pressing a button to actually speak it. Um, and uh, and that I think is, is one of the um, um, is one one great example of how audio can um, um, can um, can change an interaction uh, um, both for input and then for also for um, for uh, for listening um, and then um, and then you see this with e-reader apps um, Instapaper or Kindle um, and we were talking about this yesterday that this is not just an issue of language it's also about accessibility um, and um, and also literacy um, that the um, the ability to just press a button and listen to what's being what's there um, to listen to um, to um, listen to the text. Or, or simply bypass text altogether and listen to a podcast. Um, the kind of rise of podcasts is, just, is an interesting example, again, of, of moving away from uh, text as the primary mode of interaction with the web and moving into audio and potentially video. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think this is going to be an urgent need um, as, um, again, this, uh, this next billion um, you know, of people who are using, who are coming from languages that have no written form. Um, the ability to interact and um, with not with um, information to share that and share that information with communities, um, I think, um, f uh, you know, that, again, these biases forcing you know forcing oral oral language communities to have to write down their language. Um, mo um, the majority of languages in the world have have, have no written form. The majority of languages in the world are oral, um, and um, and so um, uh, again, um, th rethinking the very interactions, I think, um, and. Focusing on audio, potentially video, again, as, as technologies allow for this, um, I think can be um, can be quite powerful and also just um, necessary. I think just a, an important way of preserving culture and not, um, you know, continuing this cultural imperialism that, that tech um, implicitly continues. Um, but I just have to, uh, as the queer performance artist uh, from my position, I have to talk about the body. So I want to talk, uh, Marika, about how, especially this question of embodiment on the internet and how, um, I think you called it like, you know, the internet's intervention into the provenance of bodies and how that 
functions, I think kind of can also relate to this idea of moving away from text, right? Because if we think about different, differently abled folks who might interact with information from a different place from like reading text, right? Um, I think that, I don't know, I'm, I'm in a very ambivalent position about how the body can exist uh, in a virtual space. And, you know, I just rewatched Johnny Mnemonic. <laughs> See, nobody knows what this movie is. Okay, so this was this, you know, cyberpunk vision in the '90s of like what the what virtual reality would be. It's Keanu Reeves in like one of the um, most the best Keanu Keanu Reeves role, <laughs> and his high, and the idea is that he can um, carry data in his brain. He can carry 40 gigabytes. <laughs> <laughs> And he, um, and so he's like on the black market as like a, you know, as like a data carrier across uh, international political lines. And he has to like upload it into his brain. And something went wrong and he now has 80 gigabytes. And so it's, you know, but, but, but the implication of the body in these earlier cyberpunk uh, films and, and novels, and of course, was that the body would somehow kind of, you know, disintegrate into technology in a very horrific, dystopian way. Um, like he keeps saying, I need to get online because he needs to, he needs to like empty his head. Um, <laughs> Sorry for this detour, but it seems pertinent. Um, so I was wondering, I mean, I'm very interested in how the body gets sort of represented and archived and replicated uh, and erased and all of these things. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that in its relationship to the internet, to digital, virtual space. Sure, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting and important question, right? Um, and there's much written about kind of especially I think in the early 2000s about the kind of potential for the internet as a space where you wouldn't kind of be tied to your body as a kind of freeing potential to kind of live in a world where you could evade kind of race and class and gender and all of the things that kind of constrain our physical bodies as well as issues of kind of ability and other kind of constraints of the physical body. What's actually happened of course is hasn't happened. Um, people's avatars tend to represent things about their own experience. We know that kind of all kinds of things um, that ha happen to physical bodies, in the kind of physical world happen in the digital world as well, right? It perhaps frees up kind of certain kinds of harassment to happen even in kind of a greater extent, right? Um, is there's the kind of potential of anonymity and apparently when given anonymity, we get even kind of more racist and sexist and classes than we feel perhaps free to be um, when we actually have to look at someone. So I think that some of that kind of potential for the body to disappear just, we still kind of interact with the digital world in the same, in, in constrained by the same kind of paradigms in which we live. It's hard to think outside of the constraints of race, class, and gender, even if you're in a world where maybe you can make your avatar look like whatever you want it to look like, right? We still are constrained by thinking in ways that are formed in a kind of another world. And I think that it's part of that kind of temptation to draw a line between the physical world and the digital world, right? As two separate worlds when in fact, I don't, I don't see them as separate worlds, right? They continue their racism, classism, classism, like sexism in the real world, there's racism, classism, sexism in the digital world. Um, and that some of that potential for the kind of body to disappear hasn't happened. And that of course constraints of physical bodies, when we're talking about issues especially of accessibility, still apply in a digital world, right? Um, depending on kind of your physical um, limitations or kind of potentials how you can engage on the internet is also shaped in that way. So I think a lot of that kind of utopic potential for the body to disappear just is not realistic and is perhaps not even a thing we want. I'm also really fascinated by the way in which kind of new identities are formed um, by the digital and the way in which those identities are highly gendered. If we think about kind of the categories 
of people that kind of didn't exist, like the programmer and things, that then the kind of proliferation of those images, right? Those are highly gendered images of kind of who is creating kind of the digital world. And it's not just that, right? It's kind of all of those images are highly gendered. And so I don't think we've escaped the body in any way. <laughs> I want to add to that. I think that we could, we could also ask about um, to what degree does artificial intelligence um, promote an erasure of our humanity, or we could call it the body, um, or a human experience? Um, so those of us who study algorithms um, kind of critically, you know, we talk about the ways in which human beings now um, who engage with algorithms in everyday life are more likely to trust the algorithm than to trust previous forms of knowledge, right? Charlton Gillespie writes about the, um, how algorithms have become so fundamental to the human experience that they've started to replace common sense, um, credentialed experts, or uh, the scientific method, and even the word of God, right? So this is what he says. And, and I think th these kinds of ways of, of seeing a disappearance of the body um, we could argue by our increasing reliance upon an artificial intelligence is something that's really important and worth examining and thinking about into the future. So, you know, what would, it, what would it mean that, and you hear people already in such common everyday ways talk about, um, I heard a provost once of a uni big university say something, what was reported that he said, um, what do we need the library for when we have Google? Right, so it's like you have an interesting notion of um, of human knowledge, right, and, and and its complexities, and that even the process. I mean, you you know, if you've had to go to the library to actually do research, which I know, like, I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands because I already know um, <laughs> that the number is low. And so, what does it mean that again we trust an algorithm to give us? A decision or give us knowledge or to have already curated or done the hard thinking for us and you know there are people who are writing in controversial ways about this like Nicholas Carr right who's talking about the neurological effects of how our brains are changed by this kind of instant gratification instant always uncritical um, our loss of it, our ability to think and so I think this is like you know, could be a very important aspect of rethinking what it means to think about embodiment and um, that we trust our technologies to embody a level of our humanity that's better than our own humanity, right? And I, I think that's incredibly complicated. And I, I think, you know, there, there is this opportunity instead of erasing the body to make the body even more visible um, and uh, more nuanced and, uh, um, you know, the, the um, it's just reading um, in an article about how um, Tumblr has helped um, create a, um, the, the kind of Tumblr culture of, of, the, ta of the tags and of, of talking about gender and gender identity has, cr has helped foster a, a significantly more nuanced um, you know, a kind of language around what gender um, and uh, gender identity look like. Um, so moving beyond kind of male-female binaries into uh, gender queer identities, um, LGBTI identities, things like that, and um, and um, and then similarly, we could talk about this with with race and class. Uh, this kind of um, you know decision to, to flatten um, you know race into these these big categories. Instead, look at the nuances of what people's racial and ethnic identities look like. Um, there's there's actually it seems like there's an opportunity to uh, to make the body more visible um, and um, more visible in its specificity. Um, and that um, rather than erasing the body, it's about bringing out that our humanity. Um, and uh, um, of course, there there are risks to this. Um, you know, especially if you are um, highlighting um, a marginalized identity, um, you know, um, that can create a, 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 a non-safe space um, for, for these communities. But um, at the same time, um, the visibility of one's body, um, making that visible, making that visible to other people, um, becomes an important way for, um, for um, especially marginalized communities to find um, identities that may not be represented in mainstream media. Um, and uh, um, I think particularly the, the, the um, trans and LGBTI communities um, uh, have, um, you know, there's a lot of great studies on how this, um, the, the being visible to each other um, is itself a powerful act. And so um, I think uh, um, making our bodies more visible seems uh, like a critical act of justice. 